down into the water. Oh, go, go. Yes, I remember. No more than a girl I was, sitting at my mother's knee when she told me of her crossing over from Africa. The slaveholders let her up out of the hole. Now the hole was where they kept the slaves all tied together like cattle, but they let her run and play on the deck of the ship. For they had no fear of one little girl. I mean, small, strong, soft in stature, and the sea was so blue, so. I, I felt like I was placed in another world, a blue world. I'd be standing on the deck of the slave ship, lost, alone, far from the white sands and greenness of my home. I'd be a girl child all cried out, dead like. I'd be standing the deck of the slaver ship when I'm hypnotized by the dark face reflected in the waters below me. She tells me I will never see my home. I will never see my A 
mournful sound. They be grieving as well. Grieving for the corn, the village, the children whose tormenting feet they escape on the rooftops. And now they be singing sadness. That trickles trails of yellow light into this blue world. They be cages of birds, mostly grieving hens and mourning doves. The doves coo, ooh, ooh, ooh. Misty gray tones, the yard birds scat. Oranges bruising purple sand. Tongues 
many eyes all conjuring the, the same thing. Uh, freedom! Uh, if it be death, so be it now. We ate at that feast of misery for days and nights. The ship is tossed about, and I've been holding on to myself. Myself, the African girl child with open wounds. Hey, oh, now, hey, oh, yeah. I can see your way. I The other Africans reach out for me, not with hands, but with spirit and song and magic from the ancients, washing the legs with the big rustic.
And I said, Mama, 50,000 women, Mama. Shh. Oh, Mama. Now, Mama. Now, Mama. Say, Mama, say, That wasn't my mother's face. It was another woman's face. Standing in the shadows of a cracked night. With bodies piling up all around her. Seeing her life go late. And somebody was calling on God. The girl stood in the yard and she said, oh, God. What God? Are you watching this, God? Are you running with me, God? What God? And then that man, the blonde white boy, the blonde white boy, he was with us. He was with us. We was all standing around in the yard, the yard shadows fell, and that boy, that boy, honey, hush, no girl, that boy, that boy threw back his blonde head, and he sang to the heavens, and he said, good Lord, good Lord, good Lord, I feel, I feel like I'm dying now. Did we die? Did we try to die? Are we dead yet? Do we dare live? Good Lord, I feel. Oh! Good Lord, I feel like I'm dying. And she went and I across the room. She saw me at Bob's funeral and she said, I know you. I know you. You know me. I see you. I see you. I remember you.
Now that's another term for the migratory track. We, my family, my mother and father, we were migrant workers. We would travel, headed north, picking vegetables, fruits, to fill the tables of America. You feel me? You feel me? That's what we were doing, okay? We're going up the road. And my father, my gorgeous father, my praise and outrageous father, gets it in his mind one morning to stop at somebody's watermelon patch. And my mother, of course, is admonishing him, as she always did. My mother is like, oh, man, we are going to jail today. That's what's going to happen here. And my father says, that's all right. My children are going to have some fresh watermelon for breakfast. And we've been asleep, and now the car is stopped, and daddy is headed, headed to this watermelon patch, somebody's watermelon patch. And we're headed for daddy. That's daddy. Daddy, daddy, daddy. And daddy's standing out there surveying the watermelon patch. And he says, uh, he says to me, uh, Swamp. That was my nickname, Swamp. It comes from the word swamp seed, which I found out much later also. It's like the lily pad that grows in the swamp on the water. I was his swamp seed. So he says, Swamp, which one you want? I said, Daddy, I want that one right there. He said, That one. So he reaches over and he picks up this watermelon. Have you ever seen watermelon still on the vine green? Have you seen this? It is the real emeralds in the earth, you know, the watermelon. So daddy said, this is the one you want? I said, mm. My father picks this watermelon up, holds it over his head, his head, and he plummets it to the ground. And he says, eat that dark red part right in the middle, because that's the heart of the watermelon. That's the best part. My brother Bill says, daddy, I want one too. And he said, daddy, I want this one. And my father says, you want this one? My father picks it up over his head, and he plummets it to the ground. He says, eat that dark red part. That's the heart, the sweetest part of the watermelon. Flo says, Daddy, I want one. So Daddy picks hers up, and it's boom. And then uh, Tony says, boom. And he says, there's a feeding frenzy of watermelon. My mother is standing there going, we're going to jail. <laughs> we're going to jail this morning. My father says, that's all right. They're having fresh watermelon for breakfast. And next thing I know, my mother's climbing out of the car. Because she's thinking, maybe she should have some fresh watermelon, too. <laughs> and, my, and she said, but Gus, man, we're going to jail. My father said, you know what? I may go to jail this morning. But all of my children have just had fresh fruit for breakfast. And they've all learned this morning what and where to eat, and they've been taught this morning that it's the heart of the watermelon, because that's the sweetest part, the heart of the watermelon. Whoa! My dad, my 
My father was something else, honey. He was, you know, he was, as they say on the street, the brother was no joke, okay? <laughs> if my father stepped on your foot, he'd say, well, put it in your pocket. <laughs> well, nobody have to step on it the next time. <laughs> but he was lovely. He was lively. And I think he liked my mother very much because there was a whole bunch of us. We kind of, you know, we kind of, we kind of confused. It was like all these kittens, you know, of, of puppies. And he'd be like, where did all these babies come from? Anyway, he was a master storyteller, a guitarist. He played me some blues, baby. He could play guitar. He was an original hot fan, you know what I'm saying? Lady killer. of how he found my mother. You know, he found her. Well, the story goes that he was riding the rails. My father and his friend, Henry Taylor, would jump trains all the time. A young man. He was going to see the world, damn it. He was going to see the world one way or the other. He even met Woody Guthrie once, my dad. But this story is, is that one morning, they get they act and ride the rails all night, and they jump off, they fall asleep under a wagon in Valdosta, Georgia. Just as the uh, sun is coming up, he opens his eyes, he says, uh, and uh, these legs was walking by. <laughs> a job. Now for you people who don't know Southern history, the commissary in the South was where everything happened. Everything. Everything happened at the commissary. That's where you got your food, that's where you got the news. Anyway, he went to bed, he gets hired, and the guy says to him, well, go to my house, go to the back door, knock on, knock on the back door, and my cook will show you where you put your things. So he goes. But why not? It's the late eggs, honey. <laughs> they were married three weeks later, and they were married for 45 years, okay? <laughs> oh my God, my father. Okay, I'm having a senior moment. Where am I going, y'all? <laughs> <laughs> but I can't remember shit. <laughs> Fast forward, rewind the 1920s, Georgia. In the 1920s, Georgia, which is still deceptively beautiful, despite all the blood that's soaked in the ground, beautiful Georgia, the pine trees, the the peach trees. Uh, at any rate, in the 1920s, the Cannons still owned my mother and her seven brothers and sisters. You see, my, fa my grandfather, Thomas Walden, had been, this is my mother's paternal, my paternal grandfather, my mother's father, had been a brakeman on the Southern Railroad. And the story goes is that uh, my grandfather, Thomas, was coming home one night from work and uh, apparently a black man supposedly had peeped in the window at two white girls on this long uh, country road. And the patty rollers were out doing what they do, creating mischief and mayhem. They catch my grandfather and because he was the only black man on the road that time of night, they tell him, that if he fears for his life, he will leave the state of Georgia right then and there. No, he did not get to say goodbye to his wife and eight children. 
my grandmother and grandfather didn't see each other for 30 years. So my, grand, my grandmother and her children had to make do as best they could. But this is a lovely morning at any rate in Georgia. And uh, the piney woods are tall and luscious. The peach tree blossoms are full. And the cotton is pushing up through the black, black, black clay. See my aunt, Willie May. My aunt Willie May, who is my mother's oldest sister, is on her way to work for the Cannons. They didn't have no daddy, so everybody had to work, so this is a lovely Saturday morning. But she would rather be doing something else, but she's a 15-year-old black girl in the 20s, and so she's headed to work all day at Miss Cannon's house. Looks like we're in for a fine spell of weather. Days done gone by, and we're still together. Oh, sweet freedom sounds on the wind. I'll know you forever as my friend. Pine trees come calling for me. And I can't see, oh, ocean blue, hear me too. For I wouldn't be living but for you, yes, for you. And clouds and skies and wonderful light. Yes, clouds and skies and wonderful light. Looks like we're in for a fine spell of weather. Days done gone by. And we're still together. Oh, sweet freedom sounds on the wind. I'll know you forever as my friend, as my friend. Willie May? Yes, ma'am. Willie May, I am so disappointed in you. You're going to have to clean the bathroom again. Yes, ma'am. And Willie May, you're going to have to do all the windows because it is time for my spring party. Yes, ma'am. And Willie May, when you're done with the laundry, you got to go in the kitchen and you got to clean up mama because mama finished her breakfast and you know she makes such a mess. She made a mess all of everything. You got to clean her up, dress her again, then you got to sit her on the porch and then you got to clean the kitchen. Miss Cannon, I got two bushels of clothes here to iron. Now you're telling me I gotta do the bathroom again. Then I gotta do the windows. And then I gotta go take care of old Miss Cannon. I can't do all this work by myself. I don't feel good. I'm going home. <laughs> That's what she did. <laughs> Pretty soon, Mr. Cannon and his posse rise up to my grandmother's little shack. Where's your mammy, Piggy Nanny? <coughs> yes, sir. Oh. Anna? <coughs> I've been pretty good to you people, haven't I? <coughs> well, it does be poorly to have to stand here today and tell you that that there gal of yours, Willie Ray, well, she come up to the house with a regular bee in her body, yes she did, and proceeded to give my wife, my dog, my cat, my bird, and my mother-in-law a piece of her mind, and then decides that she don't feel good, and she went home. No, Mr. 
can't, I can't believe what she did. And me and the boys, we decided that we had to come down here and chastise that girl for such a salty tongue. Right, boys? That's right. We're going to chastise that girl because we are a salty tongue. Of, what's that little pastor say? She's talking a regular little rain ticket, baby. No, Mr. Cameron. I mean, begging your pardon, sir. Let me whip us up. I wouldn't feel right if I didn't whip him myself. Please, Mr. Cannon. Please. Let me whip her, sir. She done brought such shame on this family of good niggas, sir.
and uh, Arisika and I were discussing women on the planet, and, and she shared with me that it was Judy Gron, who the great poet Judy Gron back in the day, who started to peruse menstruation and its relationship to the planet. And uh, she and I agree as well that menstruation more than likely invented the world. <laughs> when you think about how men must have sat like, they're like this, every 28 days, some woman's bleeding and then she don't die. <laughs> And then there was the moon and menstruation. Ah, it probably more than likely gave birth to the calendar. Okay? And um, this kind of magic, this kind of power, could appear very, very dangerous, okay? So it was all right that everybody was thinking about all this, but in the land and the mind of men, this was some dangerous and heady stuff. Check it. Now, rape is at epidemic proportions. 50,000 women have disappeared in India in, I guess, the last year, okay? Um, a congressman can stand before a law building, creating body, and discuss rape versus legitimate rape. Mm -hmm. Pretty heavy stuff. And let us not forget South Dakota right now as we speak is attempted to obliterate all a woman's rights to choose. Change channels. Fundamentalists believe that a woman cannot go to court and accuse a man of anything unless she can bring two men with her to vouch for her honesty. Two men to assure the court that this woman is not a liar, okay? And I ain't lying. I got two men right here. I got two men. Let's hear it for David Molina and Eve
Lordy, Lordy, Lordy. Oh, you got me showing out now. <laughs> what? What did you dream as a nine-year-old girl? I saw, a I saw two lovely little nine-year-old girls today. One of them was hanging off the, the grocery cart like this. And her mother's like, stop it, Samantha. And I said, boy, you look, you know, to me. I'm like, that looks really cool. She goes, I bet you can't do it. I said, you're right, I can't do that anymore. Her mother's looking at me like, lady, please. Do not encourage her. <laughs> and the other one was getting her nails done for the first time with her grandma. Grandmas are like that. We're always, you know, we're breaking all the rules. <laughs> and, uh, so I was thinking as I was making she that at nine years old, and a fast forward, rewind for a minute. I read in more magazine about uh, two or three months ago an article by this woman that ascertained that at nine years old, girls are fully formed as far as their, their psychic, their spirituality, and their determination even. At nine years old, we think we know what we're going to do, and we got it all figured out. Now, my father was my sounding rod. I told my father everything. So at nine years old, I told my father my plan for my life, the future. Daddy, you know what? He speaks in the car. He comes out and he goes, what? Well, when I grow up, I'm going to be the star of the Russian ballet. <laughs> He's like, okay, sure. And I said, and I'm going to have a pink limo, and I'm going to have three apricot poodles, and I'm going to have lots of boyfriends. I'm never getting married, and I'm going to have a pink jet. Now, the, the gift was the light in my father's eyes. He comes out from under the car. He's a poor man, and he's trying to fix this old pole this old car. He stands up and he looks at me. And as we do, as we do, we patronize children, you know. And, uh, at least, and sometimes little boys are allowed to at least dream. Little girls have to go do something, you know. But my father stood there and he looked at me and there was no patronizing in his eyes. And he said, I bet you will, Swamp. In fact, I know you will. I'll be right here waiting when you do. And I said, yeah, and then I'm going to take my pink jet, and I'll come back, and I'm going to fly all of us all around, all around the whole family. We're going to fly all over the world. You just wait and see. And he said, I'm going to be waiting. My father loved me. He listened to me. He was the first man to let me be heard. You know, and uh, I cherish his memory more than anything as I constructed she and called him up from the grave. Wish I could say I'd give you more, but I'm down the road, I'm out the door, and you can feel this too. Oh, and I'm, I'm just so fond of you. Wish I could say I'd play the friend, but I've read the script, I know the end, and you can feel it too. Oh, and I'm I'm just so fond of you. The night is green. The night is blue. Oh, and I'm, I'm just so fond of you. La, 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 la. La, 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 la. la. Oh, and I'm just so fond of you. Wish I could say, hey, you dance. Mm -hmm. 
to mature that. <laughs>
and not Chavina. This is South African women simply singing. South Africa. The faces, the bodies, are the faces and bodies of white women the world over. It is a challenge for me to watch over them outside. When they attempt to follow me into handstands, back bends, cartwheels, even squat thrust. The fresh air, the oxygen, the body's memory taking over recalls our girl spirits. It is a joyous ferocity like none I have ever experienced. Making art on the other side of the world. I am just outside of Johannesburg. I am six miles from Soweto. I am at Natural Leader Prison.
जागो We women are a culture unto ourselves. I ask you each every day to look long at yourself in the mirror. See me at Natchimina Prison, at Pretoria State Prison, at Torrin Prison for Women in Italy, at San Bruno County Jail in San Bruno, California, Chachilla, Ocala State Prison for Women in Florida, Harrison County Juvenile Probation in Houston, Texas, the global classroom. How many people did the homework? Did you bring your homework? And we're in the convent, y'all laughing at me. Uh, 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 uh. Ladies, ladies, your writings are going to be what I will use as director to create theater for incarcerated women. It will be your response to the questions that we find as we discuss the ways and means of our lives, as we discuss ways to get back home to our families, as we discuss forgiveness. So. If you didn't do your homework, there will be more homework. Now yesterday, we talked about what I know now. Did anybody write about this? Lindsay Way. Oh, good, 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 good. Silly of me to have chased what is known as the life, the plastic world driving German cars, living in expensive suburbs, exclusive suburbs, sending the children to expensive private schools, buying the trendiest gadgets to be the coolness. Trebe, trebe. Silly of me. Was all it worth it? Hell no. Look how it turned out. Me behind these walls. Missing out on every one of my children's accomplishments. Me behind these walls with so much uncertainty. Me away from my children. The long dark halls. The late, late hours. Believe me, I know now. Thank you, Lindsay Wayne. Okay, I want us to go even deeper. I want you to look at yourself, look at your life, and I want you to create a portrait of who you are. Forget about what anybody may judge or say about you, but I want you to be thinking about who, what it is that you know about yourself. And give me a portrait. Well, it could be a letter, it could be a poem, whatever. Felicia, okay, good, 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 good. I'm from, get it how you live, I'm from, take it as it comes, I'm from, live ladies stay away from loose lips, I'm from, girl, where did you get those shoes, I'm from, how did you pull that dude, I'm from, where did you get that car, my so-called friends hate from afar. I'm from where baby daddies love to beat on baby mamas. I'm from motorcycles rolling up and down the street. Vroom, 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 vroom. I'm from everybody going to parties, sipping on Bacardi. That's where I'm from. Thank you, Felicia. <laughs> Did anybody write about honoring yourself? Oh, watch it.
I suppose my life has been a hard one. But I honor myself by standing here today to say that I'm not dead yet. Many times I've contemplated suicide as a way out of my past. Fall the temps, child abuse, sexual molestation, rape, torture has been in my past. And I've had a lot of downs, but I've had some ups as well. And I guess that's why I'm still standing here today, honoring the fact that I am still alive. Thank you, Wancha. Which brings us to that delicate place of what makes you cry. Come on, y'all, let's get real. I know we hard asses and all that, but what makes you cry? Because it's okay to cry, but then we gotta stop crying. Then what we gonna do? Come out loud. It is simply a flashback from my past. A painful prodding that comes now and then. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was drunk, angry, not thinking straight. I stabbed him, and I stabbed him again in the neck and the blood. So here I am, down on my knees, trying to stop the blood from, from flowing, and it's coming out of everywhere. Out of his nose, out of his mouth, even out of his eyes, and out of that hole that I made with my knife. And everybody is screaming, and nobody is helping, and I'm not thinking straight. And there's so much blood on my hands. By the time the ambulance arrived, he had already died. And I was just 17. Thank you, Kamala. Has anybody attempted to write a letter to our younger selves. Come on, ladies. We've been through a lot. But if you could, if you could speak to your younger self, you know when you're 12, 13, hey, you think you got it going on, what would you tell that little girl? What would you tell her about what's out there? It's literally writing a cautionary tale. Anybody take this? Oh, Cassandra. When I found out that I had contracted HIV, I didn't feel like I was worth much or deserved much. Really kind of silly, don't you think? There's always somebody to judge you. But I found that HIV, AIDS, is a health condition, not a crime. Little girl. I don't want you to go down that road. I don't want you to participate in unprotected sex. I don't want you to shoot dope, use dirty needles. But if you're looking for more of yourself to love than HIV AIDS, I would say to you, my darling little girl, let's take a page from our friend's book of recovery. You gotta fake it till you make it. I love you, my little girl. Thank you, Cassandra. I want us all to go deeper. I want us all to look at the best part.
charge of ourselves. Nobody ever writes about me at my best. We need to. We need to honor ourselves. We need to know where we've been and how we have survived. The best part of yourself. But you know, we bury that part. You know, we eat too much. We sex too much. We shop too much. We put ourselves in harm's way. We look for love in all the wrong places. She comes into a world where she hears, Ooh, baby, baby, you so fine. Ooh, baby, you so fine. Carry this bag for me. Ooh, baby. Oh, baby, you so fine. Cash this check for me. Usually somebody else's check, of course. And we do it. She does it. We do it blindly. Love me, love me, love me, love me. We do it all the time. We sacrifice our lives. We sacrifice our families. We sacrifice our children. We sacrifice our dreams. She does it all the time. The next section I'm going to do, I'm going to say nobody told her, and you're going to say nobody. You ready? Uh, are y'all ready? Yeah. Come on now. You didn't even make your homework, damn it. No, I, gotta, I still got to do all the work. Damn. You too. <laughs> nobody told her. Nobody. Nobody told her. Nobody. Now she can't believe it when it's said. Born behind the eight ball. Nobody. Life's a house of cards. Nobody told her. Nobody. Nobody told her. Nobody. That it could all be blown away. Her house, her money, her children, her love, her life. Nobody told her. Nobody, Nobody told her Nobody. that life is simply a house of cards. Nobody told her. Nobody. Nobody told her that she's the one waiting in that hotel room. She's the one standing in that alley. Nobody told her. Nobody. Nobody told her. Nobody. Nobody told her. Nobody. Nobody told her. Nobody. That it could be Subic Bay in the Philippines. That it could be Ellison Taylor in San Francisco. It could be Mike McCoffin Boulevard in Oakland. She's getting on that train. It can be Flamina Highway just outside of Spoleto, Italy. It can be Fairfield Road in Johannesburg. Nobody told her. Nobody. Nobody told her. Nobody. That while doing time for prostitution, trying to get enough money to feed her baby, nobody told her. Nobody told her that her baby's brains would be splattered on the back seat of a car in the Tenderloin or Soweto. Nobody told her. Nobody told her. Nobody. Nobody. So how could she know? Nobody told her. We are we. We are the global community, are we not? Yeah. Are we not? Whether we like it or not, okay? We are now a global community. From South Africa to San Francisco to the Brahma Theater Center, we are that community this afternoon. Yeah. 